<laughs> All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. And a big thank you to Tia Williams, who is the author of Seven Days in June, which was our um, February romance novel this month. Uh, I'm going to introduce you by reading a very short biography, if that's all right with you. Okay. Uh, so Tia Williams has uh, had a 15-year career as a beauty editor for magazines including Elle, Glamour, and Essence. In 2004, she pioneered the beauty blog industry with Shake Your Beauty. She wrote the best-selling novel, The Accidental Diva, and penned two YA novels, It Chicks and Sixteen Candles. Her award-winning novel, The Perfect Find, will be adapted into a Netflix film starring Gabrielle Union. Tia's most recent novel, Seven Days in June, was a Hello Sunshine book club pick and a New York Times bestseller. And she lives with her daughter and husband in Brooklyn. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is such an honor. Well, thank you for writing such a brilliant book. Um, my members will attest to the fact that romance is not my genre, <laughs> mm. but I was so thrilled to read your book. It was such a refreshing um, take on the genre, I will say. Yeah, I have a lot of people say that, like, I don't really read romance, but this one was the exception or this one made me interested in romance. So, yeah, that's something I hear quite a bit. Well, is there anything in your bio that I didn't touch on? I mean, I know it was a short bio. So is there anything you want to add to how you got to where you are today? Um, so I always knew growing up that I was, I wanted to do two things, be an author and be an editor at a fa at fashion magazines. Those were my two big passions. I'm, I love beauty, makeup, skincare, hair, all of it. So I wanted to be a beauty editor. Um, and so I graduated from college in 97 from UVA, moved to Brooklyn that summer and started working in magazines. So I worked at Elle and Glamour and Teen People and Essence all over. Um, and about three years into my career, I guess I was, I was 25. Um, I was like, okay, it's time to pursue the second part of my dream and write a novel. Um, and it just so happens that I was dating a maniac at the time. I was working for a very intense fashion magazine. This is Devil Wears Prada era. Um, and things were going, things felt topsy-turvy in my life. So I quit my fashion magazine job. I broke up with the guy put all my stuff in storage and I moved to Seville, Spain on sabbatical for six months um, to write, uh, to, to work as an English teacher. And while I was there, I started writing just for myself, the story of my relationship with this maniac, but I wrote it in my favor so that he was a great guy, there was a happy ending, all of it. And then by the end, I was like, oh, this is a novel. And when I moved back to New York six months later and start working magazines again, I got an agent and I sold the book and that was my first novel. And it was published in 2004, The Accidental Diva. And so ever since then, I've been doing both. Yeah, um, so I just did the math there, like for the beauty when you graduated and yeah the beauty routine must be paying off oh my goodness <laughs> I do know my way around skincare also this is brilliant concealer and DNA I yeah, have to say it looks like something my happening. parents have really great skin <laughs> okay um the other so you are you still working in magazines now or you are writing full-time so uh a, a year ago in March, I finally quit my day job and I never had before. So yeah, for the past year, I've been solely writing novels. Yeah. But it sounds like maybe it was great that they went hand in hand for so long. Yeah, you know, I learned a lot. It's funny, you know, I hear a lot that my scenes feel very descriptive, like you're standing in the middle of the scene. Um, and, I got that from being a beauty writer, you know, uh, because here's the thing, there's, 
every spring there's going to be a pink blush every december there's going to be a red lip every you know this is not reinventing the wheel and so you have to make that pink blush sound like it is the most delicious pink blush that has ever pink blushed <laughs> you have to have colorful language be very evocative about it make the reader want to take off all their clothes and roll around in this pink blush you know and it's it's it was that sort of exercise as a beauty journalist um that helped me be very descriptive in fiction helped me you know find my voice in fiction so yeah one one discipline sort of fed the other i think i love that description that's so great <laughs> Uh, ladies, if anybody wants to ask a question live, there is the raise your hand functionality and I'll make sure that you get to ask, but you can also pop your question in the chat window. If you have, um, everybody's already read the book, so no spoilers, no problem, everything. Oh, good. <laughs> um, I do have a whole bunch of questions that I got emailed today, so we can go start to go through those. Um, but we will take, um, any questions that come in over the ones that were emailed. So feel free to ask away. Uh, one of the big questions I got several times was that the Reese pick and the TV adaptation, like, what has that experience been like? Oh my God. So exciting. So the Reese, um, pick, I didn't know this, but it is a huge secret. Like when you find out you cannot tell anyone because, um, Reese makes the announcement the first of every month. And there's all these like all this like lead up to it on the app and on the Instagram account. Like, can you guess what it is? Here are some hints. Like, it's it's a she really drums up excitement about what each month's pick is going to be. So I couldn't breathe a word, which was very hard because this is very exciting news. Um, but yeah, it just it changed everything. It changed my life. You know, it opened open my readership up to truly an international audience um, that I might not have reached otherwise and an audience of avid readers um, you know that really sort of hang on her every pick you know um, so yeah I, I mean it's just been so exciting and then on a personal level Reese Witherspoon and I were born in the same year. And so every movie she's ever been in, I've compared myself to where she is in the movie, like in my real life. So when she was a teenager in those movies, I was a teenager when she was like a young 20 something, like in rom-com, you know? So I, I just feel like I have a personal parasocial relationship with her. So this is very, um, very exciting, yeah. And then I, you know, it was my first New York Times bestseller. So yeah, I owe a lot to her. Well, she must have a good beauty routine as well, or some good DNA, as you say. <laughs> I know. She's gorgeous. Um, and the TV adaptation. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah. So um it got optioned by uh Will Packer for a TV series. Um, we're still at the beginning of production sort of putting the whole team together so I don't have any you know talent e to spill um but I'm so excited to cast this this story I have ideas but you know yeah that's always, that's always a funny thing isn't it how much uh do you know how much you'll get to play in in like so I'll get to be an executive producer which means that I'll I'll be pretty involved so the perfect fine which was my novel before seven days in june um the netflix film starring gabrielle union is coming out this summer and that i didn't have any um any creative input on um which was my choice it was my first time hollywood is a different language you know it was kind of like here's my baby do you know do with her what you will um so this time i definitely have more of a hand in it which is exciting gabrielle union though you can't really go wrong can you <laughs> i know oh my god so exquisite good word good word <laughs> yeah um so the book we can maybe we, sorry i just muted myself halfway there uh maybe we can dive into a little bit about the book um if anybody has any uh character specific or plot specific questions then now is the time for those 
uh, I appreciated so much about this book and I'm like women's literature is kind of my happy place. So I guess mm-hmm. that's why I liked it so much is because I really felt like it was, I mean, of course there's a big swooping romance in it, but it really, really felt like women's lit. Do you get that mm-hmm. a lot? I do. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because I'm not, I I don't set out to write a romance. It just happens that way. <laughs> like I always think of, I mean, I love romance. I grew up on romance novels. Um, but I always think I'm writing, you know, contemporary fiction, contemporary women's lit, and then there a big love story happens. It just happens. <laughs> um, it's always my focus. Like I think it was Stephen King that said, you know, with genre writers, like you, there could be a car crash and a western writer, a thriller writer, a romance writer, you know and a thriller writer could all look at that car crash and interpret it in totally different ways based on the way their mind works because of their discipline. Um, and because I am you know, just a really romantic person, I see it in the news. I wonder if the newscasters are having an affair. You know, that's just my, I, I go there. Well, we're glad you did. Um, oh, Jill would like to know more about Tia's research process for writing a character with chronic pain. My research process for writing a character with chronic pain. Well, I didn't have to research. <laughs> I have had chronic, incurable daily migraines since I was 10 years old. Um, hospital stays, every medication you can think of. Um, you know, it's the thing that rules my entire world. It's, and it's not a headache. It's truly debilitating and it's an invisible illness. You know, you're not in a wheelchair. You're not, you don't have crutches. You're not bleeding. You know, you look normal, whatever normal looks like. And so people have a hard time believing that you're as sick as you are, um, which has really, it's been the biggest obstacle of my life. Um, and I always wanted to write about it, but it just never seemed to have a place in a frothy romance. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, this book that I felt like I really had the chops to handle it. And even then my, you know, my first draft, my editor was like, okay, but we need more detail about how bad it gets that I didn't want to do it because it like makes me nauseous to to go through what this character is going through and also I'm very prone to suggestions so if someone is talking about being in pain my pain will flare up so me writing about it was actually physically painful um but yeah so no research that was my experience that is my experience Oh, I, and I think that that was so powerful because like you said, people like, like I understand now what you went through because I read your book. Like it was so, mm-hmm. like you did such a good job actually describing it and like hearing how hard it was for you to do that. Like you did everybody who reads your book a service because you never know what anybody's going through. And that's just another mm-hmm. reminder of that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Joe, I'll ask your question. I'm not sure I understand it, but <laughs> um, I loved the play between relationships and connections that kept me involved in the story. At times I was lost with the lingo and names dropped. If I was a younger, if I was younger, would I have caught those? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here's the thing. I am a very, I'm extremely pop culture-y and I grew up in a pop culture house lots of references, lots of old movies and songs. And we watched every TV show. And to me, like what's happening in pop culture and what you're relating to in terms of pop culture says so much about the place, the time, who you are. Um, It's like what generation you're in. So I've always, and then, you know, I come from magazines and so I see a lot of things through the lens of what song was playing or what movie is happening or what 
designer people are wearing, the fashions, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's about. And it's a pretty, uh, it's kind of, I get different feedback about that. Um, you're never supposed to look at your negative reviews, but I have insomnia and sometimes, you know, I can't help it. And I'll like search on Twitter, um, my book title, you know, the tweets that people haven't tagged me in because those are the negative ones. And I wouldn't have seen them unless I started. I do hear, oh, so much pop culture, like, oh God, like, you know, I, I, I wish there wasn't so much mention of, of media or, you know, things like that, but that's just the way I write. And if you don't like it, you don't have to read it. <laughs> I feel like that's like unusual torture, <laughs> Googling your reviews. I know it's so bad. You should never do that. But I, you know what, it, like at three in the morning, your defenses are down. You're not thinking clearly. And yeah, you do the bad thing. Um, so I do want to visit another question I got, which um, I thought was very uh, good. She said uh, that the positive depictions of Black love were very, very strong. And I wanted to know why that was important to you, too. I mean, both of your characters are obviously Black. Um, and mm -hmm. also, I mean, even in the story, um, Eva's asked to make her characters white. Um, mm -hmm. So can you touch on, like, sort of the whitewashing? Yeah, the whitewashing thing. So... So I grew up in the eighties and I, you know, all the books I read, I really, I liked big, I loved Glamlet. So like Jackie Collins, Judith Krantz, Harold Robbins, um, Jacqueline Suzanne, who wasn't 80, she was sixties, but still. Um, and it was all white people. And so I, because I wanted to be in the story, I would recast the characters as black people in my head which is annoying um especially because I lived in a world with black people that I knew who did things and I didn't see that reflected anywhere um and so it was really important to me when I started writing novels to write about the amazing and boring and smart and sexy and nerdy and quirky black people that I knew um, so that readers didn't have to picture themselves as the black version of anything because we're not the black version of anything. We are ourselves and we are everything. So it's always really important to me to have, you know, that representation. And, um, you know, I just didn't see a lot of black love in media growing up. And so, yeah, that's really important to me. Of course, now there's so you, there's actually a lot, you know, there's so much diversity um, now in romance and not just, you know, in terms of ethnicity, you have, you know, queer romance and, you know, differently abled, you know, this is a, a disability rep novel, you know, there, there's so much you can choose from now, which is really exciting. And I hope it's not just a trend. Thank you. Um, Kimberly just says here, thank you for sharing your experience with an invisible illness. Agree with Erin, such a service to your audience to write about the hardships. And she wrote, you're not alone. Oh, thank you, Kimberly. All right, let's dive into Shane, who is a wonderful character. Uh, flawed character of course <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I just have to touch on the fact that why didn't he text her when he went away <laughs> because he's dumb <laughs> you know the the problem is Shane has not had to answer to anyone ever mm -hmm. this is his very first time at the big old age of 32 or 33 that he has had to be held accountable for anything you know, he travels around the world. He doesn't have a permanent home. He's never had like a permanent girl, you know, like a, a long-term girlfriend. He's never been married. He doesn't have parents. He doesn't have a family at all. Um, he's been allowed to be this 
bad boy author that, you know, doesn't follow any rules. And so he doesn't yet understand the practice of being, of how you communicate in a relationship. And, you know, not everyone knows how to love properly, especially when they haven't felt it. And so I think for him, he has, you know, he has a lot to learn. All his feeling is there and he has this huge heart and he loves her to pieces, but like the feeling and the application of it are two different things. We had like a 10 minute conversation in book club about <laughs> whether it was believable and not that he would, when he's so all consumed by her. And then the mm -hmm. end result was that we knew, we almost all knew a man that would be like that. <laughs> so. Oh my God. Yes. Yes. They are um, not as emotionally evolved as we are. Agreed. <laughs> Um, so Shane writes literary fiction and Eva writes vampire romance. What was that like a conscious choice that you chose for those genres to be? And if so, why? I mean, obviously it was a conscious choice. I guess why is why was that chosen that way? Well, I wanted to show how romance authors are not taken seriously. And we all know why. It's because women are the w women are the audience and so things that girls like are silly they're dumb they're fluffy they're not as you know there's not uh, there's not a lot of gravitas you know awarded to things that girls like i mean look at boy bands and things like that like it's not taken seriously until the, the beatles were a boy band until guys discovered them and then it was like oh they're they're cool. Um, it's and when you write literary fiction, you're taken more seriously. And it, I find it really annoying because people think that it's harder to write literary fiction, or you're, you know, you have a stronger skill set, or you're more intellectual, which is ridiculous because one of the hardest things to do is to write a convincing love story. It is so easy for it to fall flat. And as Nathaniel Hawthorne said, it is damn hard to write easy writing, easy reading. And it's, you know, creating something that um, lands softly with the reader is, is a talent. And, the dynamic between Shane and Eva and the types of writing that they do. Um, I was on a panel once. I was the only woman and everyone else was a man and they all wrote nonfiction, like important socio-political, cultural nonfiction. And they tried to make me feel like an idiot. And it was that sort of seed that was planted that made me come up with their dynamic and that scene with the panel. I like that scene when Shane enters the room and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Joanne, I'll ask your question next, but I do want to ask this one. Audrey, what a beautiful, beautiful character. Was she your favorite to write and did you mold her off of anybody? Yes, she's probably, my favorite character ever and i molded her after my own daughter um who was 12 around 12 at the time that i was writing it and i was also a single mother living in brooklyn like there, you know we have eva and i have a lot in common um yeah so my i was a single mother for 10 years um before i met my husband and it was just me and my daughter and that i don't know what it's like to be a single mother of a boy but like a single mother of a daughter uh is a very particular experience it's like this estrogen bubble like you live on your own planet you have your own language you're so bonded you know um there's no one else in the house um and 
you know, because it was just the two of us, it made my daughter a little bit more precocious. You know, she's hanging around, out with 40 year old women. <laughs> like she's, she sounds like a 40 year old woman. You know, she did at, at that time. Um, and I thought it was an interesting dynamic to write about, you know, these, this mother and this daughter that are so close. And then here comes this man. What do we do now? You know, and how is he going to fit into this? Is he going to penetrate this bubble? Is it going to be a disaster? You know, I can't help but wonder now if your husband had, where was, where were you in meeting your husband in all of this? <laughs> well, this is what, what's so crazy. When I started writing the novel, I was single, extremely single, very as single as Eva was. And um, halfway through writing it, I swiped right on my <laughs> husband. <laughs> And so when I was writing the scene, when he shows up at the house and, you know, has to meet Audrey and, you know, it's the three of them, like I had, you know, that happened. So I knew what that felt like, you know, you, you love the sky. You obviously love your daughter. You're hoping that it's okay. And, you know, sweating bullets and yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. <clears throat> Uh, Joanne would like to know, um, will we see Eva, her daughter, and Shane again in another novel? I'm not a romance reader, but I'm hooked on all your characters. Oh, thank you. Um, yes. So I just finished my next novel, which comes out in February 2024, and they make a very brief appearance. Oh, and also I'm writing a YA Audrey novel. Oh, brilliant. That's great. That's due in December, and it's going to be Audrey in high school. That's very cool. So is Eva in it as well then? Yeah, actually, yes, absolutely. Eva and Shane are in it. Yes. Okay. Oh, so we, we might hear more of it. So you will see them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're going to see them again. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Very cool. All right. Um, oh, I, I saw the, the article by the New Yorker about the books you read while you were writing this book, and I thought it was a really cute take on things. I was wondering if you could just share maybe one or two books that <laughs> you included in that. Oh my God, I don't remember. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> don't worry. What did I say? <laughs> to, to be fair, why would you remember what books you were reading while you were writing? It's not like they're oh based, my books not based on them or anything. <laughs> it was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How about some book recommendations though? Are there, what is your favorite genre? Is romance? Oh, I can't hear you. Horror. Horror? What? Yes. Oh, wow. And autobiographies and biographies. Um, I don't read a lot of romance because it freaks me out. Um, you know, you start comparing and then this other thing happens where I inadvertently start sounding like whatever romance author I'm reading. So like, I really can't read it while I'm writing because it's like, I'm, I, I'm a sponge and I just take in their style and I'm just like, I start writing I'm like, who, who is this? This is not me. Um, so yeah, I, I, try to stay away from like the genre that I write in. Um, I really like Stephen King's new novel, Fairy Tale. It's really good. If you like that kind of thing. Um, and are you reading anything right now that is especially good? Um, yeah. The Oral History of Hollywood, Jean Stein which is awesome. I love anything on Hollywood in the music industry. Shocker. Did you read, um, what was the book? Um, Taylor Jenkins reads book on <laughs> Daisy Jones in the yeah. <laughs> Yes, of course. And I actually, um, I did an event with her at a, um, book festival in Winston-Salem. So we were like in conversation. Um, right when uh, Carrie Soto is back came oh. out. Yeah, and she is fantastic. I ha we, I've interviewed her, but I've never met her in real life. So She's so much fun. Yeah, she seems it. 
Um, so when are the new, when are the pub dates for what, what dates do we need to be uh, aware of? So my next adult novel is February, 2024. And then Audrey, I believe is 2025 early. And you have um, the TV, the one with Gabrielle Union. Do you know when that's going to air? In June. June. Okay, not too far. I don't have a date. Yeah. Okay. On Netflix. All right. Well, that is all the questions I have. Does anybody else have one last question before we wrap things up? I can hear my children yelling in the background. Oh, no. <laughs> How old is your daughter now? She's 14 now. She doesn't scream in your Zoom calls anymore. <laughs> no, not usually. <laughs> okay. Oh, Jill's going to ask a question live. So since she said last question, um, I was going to go off, off book topic and ask, um, ask Tia if there was one beauty product that she could never live without for the rest of her life what it would be like a specific product or like a type of product because it's uh, blush either. I can't go anywhere without blush blush um yeah I can't leave the house without blush uh or else I look like I'm mono like I just look thick like I have the flu um but my favorite product is Smashbox is it Smashbox Glam Glow Glam Glow has an illuminating moisturizer that's, you know, a daily moisturizer, but it has a little bit of pearlescence in it. So when you moisturize, you look radiant like you just came back from a vacation. And there's like a bronzy one and a champagne one for, so the bronzy one is for darker skin. The champagne-y one is for fairer skin. And it is just the compliments I get on my skin I could have two hours of sleep the night before and I put that on and I'm just absolutely radiant. And I always, people always notice glam glow. It's amazing. It's expensive. It's like $48, but it's worth it. And it lasts a while. SPF included. SPF included. Love it. Thank you, Jill. That was a very good question. It actually made me want to know if, um, you know, the cream, the mare, creme, is yeah. it creme, de creme de la mare? Yeah. yeah. Is that worth it? Yeah. Oh. I hate to say it. And I'll be the first to say like, not everything has to be luxury or prestige or expensive. I have so many drugstore products, but la mare is different. La mare was developed as um, a burn cell. Um, so it was used on burn patients um, at first. So it wasn't even like a beauty industry kind of thing. It was from the medical industry. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. You'll have to mortgage your, you know, take out another mortgage, but it's totally worth it. Yeah, um, I always, I always see it, and I always wonder. So thank you for that. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, ladies, for joining us tonight. Um, it's such a privilege to talk to you, Tia, and we can't wait to see what you come out with next. And we'll definitely be buying it and reading it and hopefully having you um, back with us. I'd love that. Thank you so much for having me. All right. And have a great night, guys. Night, everybody.